And I uh, just want to say it's hard for me to be in the United States Senate and not to think of uh, my late father who spent his life in this Senate chamber uh, advocating on behalf of human rights, civil rights, and uh, the expansion of social justice, not only in the United States, but around the world. And uh, I'm honored to be here with a distinguished panel uh, that I will be introducing shortly. But before I do, I'd like to introduce today's hearing by beginning to talk about uh, what Senator Blunt mentioned in his opening remarks. Senator Blunt is on the Select Committee on Intelligence. That there is no subject that is brought up more on the Select Committee on Intelligence than Iran. Why is that? It's because Iran is the biggest state supporter of terrorism in the world. So that is what brings us here today, is to talk about U.S. policy towards Iran at this critical time. I suppose that it isn't a small coincidence that helps draw our attention to why we're here today than in today's New York Times and Wall Street Journal, there are leading articles about the U.S. policy towards Iran. The first story I picked up was the New York Times. And in it, the headline reads, with enrichment program a reality, Iranians claim success in stalling. In the second article in the Wall Street Journal, it talks about Iranian exile group nears U.S. rebirth. Washington moves towards taking the MEK off the terrorist list. So perhaps it's good to ask, how are these two articles related? How is taking on the threat that Tehran poses with the development of a nuclear weapon and what that will do to embolden it to continue to be the largest state-sponsored supporter of terrorism around the world, what that has to do with delisting the main opposition group to the mullahs in Tehran, the MEK, the largest organized effort of any opposition group to the current regime in Iran. Well, I'll tell you what it has to do with that. The fact is, if the United States is to see its interests fulfilled, where we see a new day in Iran, where we see a new government in Iran, then it only stands to reason we need to unleash the main opposition to the Tehranian regime, the mullahs in Iran, and that is the MEK. Now, what we will hear today is we will hear from a wide array of prominent U.S. officials who will speak to the many aspects of this issue. But most notably, I think it's worth acknowledging that in these stories, the State Department and the Justice Department no longer talk about the MEK as a terrorist threat. They talk about the MEK as a political issue that they have to deal with. And that brings me to what I've always said at every opportunity I've had to speak on this issue. And that is post 9-11, the notion that the United States government is keeping a group on the terrorist list for political reasons undermines the very integrity of our national security as a nation that we as a nation who cannot afford 
any more 9-11s, cannot afford not to be clear on who our real enemy is, that we have decided to keep an organization on the terrorist list for political reasons rather than national security reasons. Because in these stories, it talks about how the MEK has been delisted from every one of our allies in Europe, including our great ally, Great Britain. And guess what the other country that stands with the United States on listing MEK as a terrorist organization is? Iran. Boy, that doesn't say very much about U.S. foreign policy, that we're actually in the same boat as our chief opponent in the world, that we share the same position with them. Why do they want the MEK on the terrorist list? Because the MEK poses the greatest threat to, existential threat to their very being. Why? Because the MEK supports a non-nuclear Iran. The MEK supports separation of church and state and equal rights for women. What we will hear from our panel today is what the consequences are of listing the MEK as a terrorist organization are on human rights policy and on national security issues. I will conclude by saying I believe it is in our national security interests to unleash the power to organize an overthrow of Tehran from within, as opposed to thinking that the United States or the Western world can do this alone or should only have a nuclear option on the table. I, for one, do not want American boots on the ground in Iran if we can help it. And if there is a domestic opposition group to the mullahs in Tehran that are willing to organize and work to see the day that we have a new government that is a democratic government in Iran, then I think we ought to let the Iranian organizations that are doing this work, let them do their work and do the work for all of us in the world who want to see a change in Tehran.